Um, hello, everyone. Thanks uh, for joining this webinar. Uh, my name is Rob Winspear. I'm one of the housing barristers at 42 Bedford Row. Uh, joining me is my colleague Desmond Kilcoyne. Uh, Desmond is a, a very experienced housing and property barrister here in Chambers as well. Um, I'll just start, uh, I'll present my slides now. Uh, can you see that, Desmond? It's, um, this uh, webinar is on disrepair, and uh, in particular, it's on how to value a county, claim, a county court disrepair claim. Um, Desmond and I have broken this webinar into two parts. I will be presenting the first half on the nuts and bolts of quantifying general damages in a disrepair claim. Uh, once I'm finished, I'll hand over to Desmond to present the second half of the webinar, uh, which is on more discrete issues that can arise when quantifying a disrepair claim, um, such as where the claim includes a Fitness for Habitation Act claim, um, Defective Premises Act claim, uh, issues around special damages, tenant failures to mitigate, contribution negligence, uh, as well as touching on interest. Um, once Desmond and I have finished uh, presenting, there'll be some time at the end for some questions. And I'm told that if you do have a question, there, there should be a little box that you can send that question into, uh, which Desmond and I will go through at the end of the session and, and answer a few of them. Uh, the, the webinar itself is scheduled to last for an hour, but if it finishes uh, either a little short of time or a little afterwards, um, that's fine. We'll, we'll just see how we go. And uh, just uh, to note at the beginning, if anybody listening wants to, to contact either Desmond and I, uh, please feel free to contact our clerks in uh, Chambers and they'll um, point you in the right direction. All right, so I've broken down my, my section into three parts. Uh, the first is going to be looking at the legal principles that underpin general damages in disrepair cases. Uh, the second part, which is by far the largest part, is uh, looking in detail at the current methods that are used to calculate general damages in disrepair claims. And the, the third part is, is a very short part. Uh, it's just to highlight two things that are commonly forgotten, uh, which is the Simmons and Castle uplift, uh, as well as interest. Uh, so I'll start with part one, which is the legal principles. The two main cases, on quantification of general damages uh, for breach of a landlord's repairing covenant are Calabar Properties Limited and Stitcher and Wallace and Manchester City Council, uh, which I've put on the, on the slides there. Both of those cases confirmed that the, the task for the court is to place the tenant in the position that he would have been in had the breach not occurred. Um, I've put on, on the slide an extract uh, from the judgment of Lord Justice Griffiths in Calabar properties. The way the courts have been doing that, um, restoring the tenant to his position pre-breach, is by attempting to quantify the diminution in value of the premises as a result of the disrepair. Um, so the principle is a contractual one. Uh, you've got to think about what the tenant or the leaseholder has lost because of the disrepair and the landlord breach, rather than seeing any award to the tenant as a uh, a sort of punitive measure against the landlord like you might see in a, a rent repayment order case or something like that. Because of that underlying principle, whether or not the tenant is in occupation uh, is a relevant factor. If the tenant remains in occupation throughout the entire period uh, claimed, then you should think about the diminution in value in terms of assessing the loss of comfort uh, the loss of enjoyment, inconvenience, disappointment, and um, distress of having to live with the disrepair. Whereas for a tenant not in occupation, you need to think about the diminution in value differently in terms of it being an interference with a property right, um, as well as some additional stress and inconvenience caused by tolerating that interference. Um, so, you know, the, the worry of, of your property not being repaired and the, and the hassle of having to chase up the landlord to get the repairs done. Um, but for a tenant not in occupation, it's, it's usually going to result in a lower sum than if that tenant was in occupation. And the, uh, the authority for that principle is, is more Jani and Durban Estates that you can, you can see on the slide there. Um, so that's just a brief overview of what the, the legal principle is behind um, recovery of general damages and disrepair claims. 
Um, I'll now move to the second part, which is uh, the current methods of, of calculating those general damages. It's Wallace and Manchester City Council, uh, again, that, that um, clarified the two main ways to, um, to make that calculation. Uh, Wallace says that you can either um, approach it on a global assessment of the discomfort and inconvenience suffered by the tenant uh, without reference to the rent paid by that tenant. I'll call that the global approach. Um, the second method is a notional reduction in rent. Uh, now that's an award for the diminution in value to the property um, calculated by reference to a hypothetical proportion of the rent paid by the tenant. And I'll call, I'll call that the rent reduction approach. Um, on the slide, you can see that I've written there are three methods. Um, really, there are only two. But what Wallace also said or suggested is that you can make a combination award, including both a percentage of the rent type award, as well as a separate sum for discomfort and inconvenience. Um, but in my opinion, I think it's quite risky to, to, to try and use both uh, because it can lead to, to double counting. Um, which would lead to overcompensation. So I think it's best to, to stick with either method one or, or method two. Uh, so a bit more detail on method one, the global assessment. Um, I see this as kind of more of a, it's more of an old school approach. Uh, it, it's more broad brush. And I think it finds its origins in the, the older system of quantifying general damages for disrepair, where a sort of tariff system was used for different kinds of disrepair. And so there'd be a, a flat award for, for damp or for infestation, and it, it was all quite fixed. Um, however, I think, I think this global assessment is a more difficult estimate, as there are a few steps that you need to uh, complete to come to, to arrive at a figure, uh, which can sometimes be problematic. Um, it, it relies on you looking at reports of quantum in past cases to understand what the correct amount for the kind of disrepair you are dealing with is. You can find those reports in several different places. Uh, the Legal Action Group newsletter uh, often publishes quantum reports in different county court disrepair cases. Uh, Nearly Legal is a, a housing blog which uh, often publishes um, damages awards for, for disrepair. And there is also a helpful uh, table of these reports in the Encyclopedia of Housing Law and Practice. Uh, under the notes for section 11 uh, of the Landlord and Tenants Act 1985, which is the landlord's um, implied repairing obligations. Um, one thing I would uh, note is that if you are going to use the LAG reports, uh, I would take them with a pinch of salt because it is a tenant focused publication. And so the reports that are sent in are often only going to show the very best awards from, from the tenant's perspective. Uh, and it's certainly not a landlord uh, friendly publication. So it's just something to bear in mind if you're if you are looking through those. The uh, the other difficulties with this method of calculation is that, first of all, if you're dealing with a claim that has multiple different kinds of disrepair. So say there's some damp to to the walls, um, perhaps there is an infestation, uh, maybe the boiler stopped working for for a certain period of time, there's maybe a broken shelf and some other decorative damage. It, it, it can be difficult to find a quantum report that matches the facts that you're dealing with. Um, and that sort of um, stops you before you've even begun on this, this method of assessment because you have, you have no comparison. There's, there's, there's no like for like case that you can compare to. Secondly, uh, just something to remember is that awards in past cases need to be adjusted for inflation. Um, so in addition to putting in the work to find a comparable parable case, you then need to remember to plug the figure in that case into an inflation calculator um, to, to figure out what the award would have been if it, if, if it was made today. And thirdly, um, another difficulty, in my opinion, is that you might end up having to cross-check your assessment against a rent reduction calculation in any event because of the decision in English churches and shine. Uh, that's a, the Court of Appeal Authority. Um, and I've put up a, a short extract from that case. It, it held that if an award for stress and inconvenience arising from a, a breach of a repairing covenant is going to exceed the level of rent payable, then clear reasons need to be given by the court for taking that course. Um, the, I've not put it on the slides, but the judgment continues saying that it's, it's logical that the calculation of the award for damages for, for stress and inconvenience 
should be related to the fact that the tenant's not getting a proper value for, uh, for the rent. So in other words, unless there's a good reason, the award for disrepair cannot exceed the total rent payable over the period that you're claiming. And that means that if you're doing a global assessment and the figure that you arrive at is, is high, you will often need to check what the total rent over the period is to make sure that your assessment hasn't exceeded that um, sort of upper limit. And, and similarly, although you might find a quantum report that supports a, a high award of damages, if the tenant in question has a very low rent, then the award is likely to be limited to that rent payable and, and probably reduced even further proportionately. So um, my advice is that, in my opinion, you should avoid using the global approach as your main form of assessment if possible. Where I think it is helpful is as a cross-referencing tool to your uh, rent reduction calculation. Um, to see whether the amount that you came to by using the rent reduction method is at all similar to a, to a similar form of rest, uh, disrepair that, that you, you may have found in a previous case. Um, that's something that I sometimes do. I'll, I'll look at the reports after I've, I've arrived at a figure uh, to see if I'm in the right ballpark. The global approach is also potentially helpful if the rent paid by the tenant is very low. Um, using the rent reduction approach and applying it to an already low rent might undercompensate a tenant who's had to put up with, with some significant disrepair. Um, whereas if you use the global approach, it might result in an award that's a greater percentage of the rent than what it would be if you use the rent reduction approach. So it, 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 there's possible uses, but, but I think uh, uh, personally, I prefer using the rent reduction approach. Um, and I, I'll come to that now. So, so method two is, is a notional reduction in rent. Uh, and here you have to look at the actual rent paid by the tenant over the period where the disrepair has existed in the period of claim. The first thing to think about is that if the claim is over a long period, um, and it, it could be up to six years, that's when limitation bites, then the rent may have changed. And if it has, uh, you may need to calculate an average rent over that period um, to, to, to get the, the right figure there. The second point that I want to draw out is whether the rent is paid by housing benefit or universal credit is it's irrelevant. Um, the calculation isn't based on the actual rent paid by the tenant out of his own finances. It's, it's an assessment of loss based on the, the notional rental value of the property. Um, it just so happens that if the tenant is in occupation and is paying a rent, then you, you know exactly what the rental figure is. But this uh, principle is also why leaseholders can also recover damages for um, disrepair on a diminution of rental value assessment and a rent reduction approach. Um, to, to take that example further, if, if the assessment was based on the actual rent paid uh, and the leaseholder was the person in occupation of his property, then the leaseholder would only be paying a nominal ground rent, of, say it's hundred pounds a year or something like that. Um, so if you were to apply rent reduction to the, to the actual rent paid by leaseholder, that would result in a, in a very low award uh, indeed, and, and, and that is the, the wrong thing to do. What you do with a leaseholder uh, is you, you have to create two hypotheticals, as it were. The first is to estimate what the hypothetical market rent of the property would be if the property was sublet to a tenant or it was otherwise let on the open market. Um, to get that figure, there's, there's a few things you can do. There, there are some rent calculators online that can sometimes be quite helpful in this regard. Uh, or you, you might look at listings of similar properties in the area. Or if the value of the damages uh, is large, then you, you may even want to consider obtaining expert evidence to get um, an expert valuation of the or an expert opinion of what the rent would be. Once you've got that hypothetical market rent, you then apply a notional rental reduction to that notional market rent. And that's how you deal with leaseholders. Um, and it also shows that the actual rent paid by the tenant is not necessarily the, uh, the starting point. It's all about market rent. Conversely, that works the other way. Um, with council properties, um, you might argue that the, the rent being paid by the uh, council tenant is lower than what perhaps the, the property on the open market would receive. But the way the courts uh, view council properties with council rents is that because that property would only ever be let as a council property, 
um, it will only ever attract that lower rent because it's only ever going to be used as a council property. So, so you won't succeed in, in, in an argument claiming that your council tenant should receive more than the rent that they're paying because the property would be more valuable if it was privately rented. You just won't get anywhere with that. Okay, all right. So, sorry, I just lost my mouse. Um, I'll just stay on the slide briefly. Um, you'll see at the bottom of this slide uh, that it says option one and option two. Uh, now, within the rent reduction method, you can approach it in two ways. Uh, you can see that I've summarized that as either grouping disrepair into periods, or the second option is applying a percentage to each specific item of disrepair um, for the period that it is in disrepair. So dealing with option one of method two, um, what this requires is looking at the various items of disrepair over a particular period, um, separating your claim into different periods, and then applying one percentage that represents the totality of the disrepair for those identified periods. Um, I have put a simple example on the slide to um, explain what I mean. Uh, so, for example, if there's damp in, in say, well, say your claim is from between 2018 to 2020, and uh, if it centres around there being damp in the property, and say between 2018 and 2019, there's there's damp in one room. Um, it's not that bad. Uh, that there's no mould that's grown yet. It's not particularly visible or you know very unpleasant. Um, so perhaps you'd attribute a 5% rent reduction uh, for the period, for that period between 2018 and 2019. Um, but say between nine, 2019 and 2020, that the, the damp hasn't been remedied and it's got worse and perhaps it's spread to different walls in, in the affected room and perhaps mould has grown. Um, you, you might argue, therefore, that the rent reduction should be higher and you, you, you attribute a 10% rent reduction for the period 2019 to 2020. Um, so, uh, totally, you've got two periods of loss. You've, you've got a 5% rent reduction between 2018 and 2019 for when the damp wasn't that bad. And then when it got worse, you, you're claiming more 10% between 2019 and 2020. That's method one. Method two is, is more granular, and it looks at each specific item of disrepair and, and you then apply a percentage to each of those items for, for the period of time that they are in disrepair. Um, I've, I've used another example on my slide just to, just to demonstrate what I mean. Um, so say in this example, the claim is, is over three years and there's three items of disrepair. Um, the, there's a defective intercom uh, that was in disrepair for the entire three years. There's, uh, there was a broken bath panel that was left unrepaired for six months. Uh, and then there was a leak um, for one month. Um, you can see that I've attributed 2% to the intercom, 1% to the broken bath panel, and 5% for the leak, because that's sort of um, more unpleasant than, than the other two matters. Um, the way this uh, option works within method two is that you would have a 3% rental reduction for that period of six months where the intercom and the bath panel was in disrepair you'd have a 7% rental reduction where the leak was ongoing whilst the intercom remained broken. Uh, and in, it, conceivably, it's possible that you could have 8% for that one month period where there was a leak if both the bath panel uh, and, the, and the intercom um, remained unrepaired. And then any period outside of when the uh, bath panel was broken and when there was a leak, it would just be that baseline 2% for uh, the fact that the intercom remained unrepaired for the entire period. Um, that's uh, summarily how, how you approach uh, option two within, within method two. Both options within this rental reduction approach are entirely valid methods. Um, I've seen both used regularly. So you might be wondering, how do you know what percentage to apply to each item of disrepair? Uh, and I'm afraid that the, the percentage you apply in either method, whether you're grouping things together or whether you're looking at each item of disrepair specifically, it's going to be quite rough. Um, 
hopefully you'll have an expert report from a surveyor or or at least some photos to base um your estimate of of what the reduction should be on um but this assessment's never going to be a science it's 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 kind of one of those things that the more you do the more you get a feel for what's an appropriate percentage reduction for um for each particular item of disrepair uh, but if i had to uh commit to, to kind of a rough guide i'd say that minor disrepair is probably going to receive between a one and ten percent rental reduction um if if say there's damp in one room that's maybe it's led to some decorative staining of the wallpaper on one of the walls you might get a, you might get a two and a half percent reduction um whereas if if the damps arisen from from maybe a leak coming from the ceiling that that's the landlord's responsibility and the leaks created a hole in the ceiling and there's there's worse decorative damage, perhaps there's some mold on the wall, then that might lead to recovery of up to about 10%. With major disrepair, um, there's another sort of method of calculation that you can sometimes apply, um, particularly where there's an argument that the affected parts of the property are so bad that the tenant can't use a particular room. Um, there's also an accepted practice of treating every habitable room within the property as a fraction of the property, um, including the uninhabitable parts. So if you look, if you look at the slide, the, um, the example that I've given that is that if there's a three bedroom house with a uh, lounge, plus some non-habitable parts like hallways and bathrooms, the way you'd look at that property is you'd see it as five 20% fractions to represent each room plus the uninhabitable parts. And uh, if one particular room is so badly affected within a property, um, the classic case is, is mold and damp. If one of the rooms is so badly affected by mold and damp that it would be unreasonable to, to sleep in there, then you can argue that there should be a, at least a 20% rental reduction to represent the fact that that tenant could not use that room. And then that's the diminution in value. Uh, and equally, if, if two rooms are, are that badly affected by a particular issue of disrepair, then you might argue for a 40% rental reduction. But this is only really applicable when um, the, the disrepair is, is quite significant. Minor, minor matters of disrepair in different rooms probably won't, um, you won't persuade the court to uh, approach it on the basis of rooms. So uh, option one or option two, My warning is, is just to be careful if you're using option two, the, the more granular looking at each item of disrepair approach, because um, I think you can very easily reach a quite a high percentage figure if there are multiple items of minor disrepair uh, within the same period. Um, the ultimate risk is that you might even exceed the 100% the of the rent threshold. Uh, and that's when uh, shine would kick in, uh, which says that unless you have a good reason to do that, that will not be allowed. Um, the, the, the other thing to bear in mind and a principle that guides me is that you also want the court to look at your calculations and think that they're reasonable. So I think it's sometimes risky using the, the each item approach uh, because you might end up over assessing a loss and then the court's going to prefer the method of calculation adopted by the other party resulting in a lower award. Um, so really the takeaway is just be, just be careful what you're deciding to do when, when you're approaching general damages. Um, but, but in conclusion, if I, if I had to choose one, I, I, I prefer to use option one of the rent reduction approach, which, um, which is looking at different items of disrepair within a period and then looking at the totality of, of the effect that it's had on the tenant and, and how much worse it's made the, the tenancy and then, and then attaching a figure to, to that assessment. I think that's more realistic and I think it's a better reflection of um, the basis of recovery that's explained in, in Calabar and Wallace. Uh, so part three, as I said, this is a very, very short part. It's, it's one slide. It's just two things that, that I think can be easily forgotten. Uh, and that's, first of all, to uh, remember to apply the Simmons and Castle uplift once you've, you've reached your figure. Um, it classically applies in, in personal injury cases. That's where I see it the most. But um, yeah, just not, not to forget that, that it also applies for, for general damages and disrepair cases. Uh, and the other thing to um, think about is that, of course, uh, you're entitled to claim interest on general damages. Uh, the going rate seems to be 2% in the county courts at the moment. Um, it, 
it, it can get quite difficult figuring out a rolling interest. So there, there's another accepted practice of calculating interest at the midpoint of each period of loss that you've identified, um, whether that's um, using the uh, method uh, option one or option two within method two. Um, but I think it's, it's something that should be thought about whether you're pleading a claim uh, or even if you're thinking of settling it and making an offer of settlement. Because if you can set out your calculations in your settlement offer in respect of interest, um, you might be able to bump up your offer a little bit more and you might be able to get the uh, the other side to accept an offer that's higher than, than it would have been if you, if you hadn't thought about inter interest when, uh, when thinking about make that, making that offer. Uh, so just those two additional things to bear in mind. And um, yes, with that being said, um, that marks the end of, of my talk on general damages. So I'll, I'll now hand over to Desmond to present the, uh, or his half of the webinar. Thank you very much, Rob. Rob, if you could, um, uh, can you take your excellent? Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. I'll just bring my screen up. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you again to, to Rob for taking us through um, what is the um, the backbone of this subject where you have a disrepair claim and you are trying to focus on what the value of the claim is. Rob is, of course, talking about the standard repairing covenant, which in a short term lease is section 11 and in a leaseholder situation will be the express repairing covenant in the lease. And it's the same, the, 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 the approach is, is, uh, is the same. Um, I think it's very interesting uh, in practice, we, we talk about the analysis of the way that these claims work. And it's absolutely correct that one always approaches, um, one approaches uh, any uh, quantification exercise according to the rules and the, and the requisite approach that we're, we're going to be discussing today. But uh, if you took the laugh, if an, alien, if an alien landed in a spacecraft and had a look at the last two cases in which um, in which um, I was involved that actually went to trial, and of course most disrepair cases will settle and won't go to trial, um, the alien might think that it's a question of either getting naught or maybe 5,000 or 10,000 or 15. It's a very simple exercise of just working out on a fairly rudimentary scale of the huge, big, large lump sums according to how bad it is. Um, I, I got a, a, a round reward of 10,000 uh, in one case and a round reward uh, against me of 10,000 in another closely, but by two district judges up in Clerkenwell it, on a very rough and ready basis. And I, I think that's obviously what you have to remember when you're considering this subject, that there is a very much a, a, an impressionistic approach that you have to take into account when you're um, quantifying and it's all part of the, both the skill and the art of quantifying damages in a disrepair claim. So as I've said, Rob has dealt with um, Rob has dealt with uh, section 11 and the, and the standard leasehold leaseholder covenant in a long lease. Um, as he said, I'm going to pick up some of the slightly more peripheral points. There are a few per peripheral points around um, the, the rump of the subject. And I've just put a list of the topics to look at. I'm also going to look at general damages, but I'm going to, to consider general damages in the context of the new implied covenant in section 9A, fitness for human habitation. Uh, also general damages in nuisance and also theoretically personal injury. And I'll go through the rest of the subject. Uh, I'll deal briefly with, or less, less, less completely with uh, damages under the Defective Premises Act, special damages, and then one or two defences, failure to mitigate loss and contribution negligence, and also a word about interest at the end. So, Section 9A of the 1985 Act. This is the uh, this is the um, the new obligation on the scene, um, introduced from the 20th of March 2019 in, into new tenancies, and from the 20th of March 2020 into all tenancies. So it applies to all tenancies, short-term tenancies today it doesn't apply to long leases. So I'm going to um, ask uh, two questions about um, section 9a. Uh, the first question is, 
is an award under Section 9A calculated on a different basis to Section 11? So I'd like to just um, consider the approach under Section 9A by, compared, by comparison with what Rob has discussed. There's a second question that I'll answer uh, later, later on, and that question is, will, a, will an award under Section 9A result in a different quantity, a different amount of damages to Section 11 on roughly the same facts? Um, so uh, let's start with the first of these, and I think this is the this is one of the interesting, it, it's the obviously interesting question that everybody's been asking for uh, before it was introduced and since it's been introduced. Uh, does it going to actually make a difference to awards um, in these cases? Um, and um, I don't think there's any clear answer yet, so that's the, that's the short answer. But um, I'm just going to um, consider a little, a little bit more detail what this covenant might be aimed at and how whether it's similar or not to Section 11. Um, it's an implied covenant uh, to make sure to ensure that the dwelling is safe for human habitation, both at the start and throughout the, um, the tenancy. So it's not focusing on the carrying out of works. Section 11 is about doing repair works, keeping installations in proper working order. Uh, and likewise, the repair covenant in the long lease will be about repair. This is not this is not this is framed in a different sort of way. It, the focus is on the suitability of the dwelling, in other words, on the qualities or the features of the dwelling looked at through the lens of habitability, health, and safety. So it's a different type of covenant. Does that throw up different issues as regards a quantification of damages? Well, I'm going to start by just considering um, uh, the cases that Rob has referred to, Wallace and Manchester. And, and bring that together with what Section A, 9A is directed at. Because in Wallace and Manchester, which is effectively the, I think, important leading case in this area, certainly for short-term tenancies, the judges, uh, in particular Morit LJ, they discuss the approach to the Section 11 damages as damages um, to put the tenant back into the position in which the tenant should be if the landlord had complied the covenant with, com with the covenant. And taking that on a step, um, they say then that really means focusing on compensation for the distress and inconvenience and discomfort to the tenant. Those three words, distress, inconvenience, and discomfort. And the word distress is in there. Uh, and that's that's very much been sank that's been approved in in subsequent cases we did have a further case um that's interesting in this connection called morjani versus durban estates and in that case and it's a case a leaseholder case the court of appeal lord justice briggs went off on a he, he went off on a very interesting um uh investigation of the of the fundamental principles of damages for disrepair and he reached the conclusion that fundamentally, even though you're valuing, providing compensation for distress, discomfort and inconvenience, fundamentally, it's about loss of amenity. Um, and what amenity means, and he didn't define it as such, but what amenity means is loss of the desirable or useful features of your dwelling. And the question is, if that is the approach to section 11, does, is that really in any way, if that's what section 11, a breach of section, we get damages for breach of section 11, it's compensating loss of amenity. Is that really fundamentally any different to damages which will be focused on uh, providing compensation where a dwelling isn't fit for human habitation? And we've got no authority as, as I've said on this, but. I think it seems that it's, it, it's, it's quite unlikely there's going to be any significant difference in approach. Um, fitness for habitation, what, is, what does that mean? Um, it's, fitness for habitation is, 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 is certainly comparing the definition of, about uh, what an amenity is. Fitness for habitation is um, a useful feature of a dwelling. In fact, you may say it's an essential feature of a dwelling. Uh, and fitness of uh, habitation is a, a loss of that is therefore a fairly fundamental loss of amenity. Uh, and if you think about it in that way, I think probably the purpose of the damages under Section 9A is likely to be 
pretty similar to the purpose of the damages awarded under Section 11 or under the leaseholder covenant. However, I'd like to just throw out in a slightly more discursive point in this, um, in this talk, just to throw out there the thought of what some other lawyers um, have been um, suggesting. Uh, and that is that, um, in fact, the fundamental basis for damages for disrepair is a little bit inconsistent. So just pausing for a second, um, I'd ask you to consider the case of a secure tenant who pays, let's say, £100 a week for a property, um, a, um, an assured tenant, a private landlord, who pays, um, let's say, £300 a week for this property, and a leaseholder who may be able to value um, a property uh, uh, considerably higher than three hundred pounds a week in a very nice um, leasehold uh, in a very nice uh, location. Suppose they all suffer precisely the same sort of disrepair and consequences of disrepair. Suppose it's precisely the same in each case. Why are the levels of award potentially different in each case? The secure tenant almost certainly is likely to have the level of award tailored and kept down by the fact that the rent is quite low. The assured tenant who's actually um, paying rent will have, again, the, the damages checked and assessed by reference to the amount of rent that the assured tenant is paying. And the leaseholder will have a hypothetical rental, even though the property is not being rented out, have a, a hypothetical rental which might be quite high or relatively low, who, who knows, by comparison with what the leasehold, that, that will be a true market leasehold. The assured tenant is likely to be a market leasehold, it might not be, it might be slightly lower or slightly, it might be slightly more, but the leaseholder will have a hypothetical market rental. All three of them are likely to have slightly different, certainly the secure tenant and the other two are likely to have a different awards of damages. And so, some, some lawyers argue that this is inconsistent and requires a reassessment of damages. And they go on and say that section 9A, section 9A provides the opportunity for the courts to refocus on loss of amenity as the basis for the damages. Now, that, that argument tends to move away from the reduction of rental approach. It tends to suggest, well, if all, all, if all three tenants or all three uh, residential occupiers have had the mice for exactly the same amount of time, in exactly the same area of the kitchen, they should all be awarded the same amount of damages. And that takes us almost full circle and takes us back to the, an, an approach rather like a lump sum award approach. Uh, and there's, there's such a, some sort of suggestion that that might be where section 9A might go. Um, however, there's no authority for that. And in my respectful view, that is probably unlikely for the foreseeable future till we get a very exceptional case where uh, some uh, judge, perhaps on appeal, takes an interest in uh, going into this in great detail. I think it's likely that the general approach that Rob has outlined is going to be precisely the same approach to nine and section 9A. So the real question then is, uh, we move on to my second question, is will an award under section 9A result in different quantum to um, section 11? So in practical terms, is it going to increase awards if you've now got this covenant that you can plead? Or if you're a landlord, if this has been pleaded against you, is it going to actually have a net effect on increasing the awards that a judge will make? Well, when you think in, in terms of fitness for habitation being an essential feature, it's not, a, not amenity, that, it's not a useful feature, it's an essential feature of a dwelling. It's very tempting to conclude that unfitness should suggest that there is a complete lack of utility. It's very tempting to suggest that if you reach that point where a property, an expert will say that a property is unfit for human habitation, that really a tenant should be getting 100% of the damages or almost all of the damages back in compensation. Um, and one might think uh, also that if a tenant can go to court and say about the landlord's uh, actions that they have been very poor in remedying the, this fundamental unfitness and that it is unfit, that there is almost a prejudicial quality now to be able to say it's unfit for human habitation uh, that is likely to increase awards. Um, and there's something in that. Um, however, 
perhaps that's not the that's not the end of the story. Um, if one has a uh, if one has a flat where the water supply has failed, the answer if an expert comes along, the experts likely to say it's unfit for human habitation. It's got no water supply. It will be unfit. But does that mean that the tenant has got no benefit from the tenancy at all? The tenant still has safety, being able to lock the front door, has shelter from the elements, has warmth uh, from the central heating system. Um, in those circumstances, really, should the tenant be getting 100% of the rent back if the tenant is going to have to go out and buy bottled water and also go and take a shower uh, at the local swimming baths? And the answer is obviously no. And the same applies for other examples that we could think of in terms of fire safety. If, a fire, if the fire safety of the building is, is uh, by virtue of cladding or otherwise, is extremely poor and unfit for human habitation, but if the tenant is visibly aware, unaware of that fact, is is that really is the really uh, is the tenant really being deprived of the whole of the value of the tenancy? The answer is probably no. So on, on that footing, I don't think unfitness as such is going to necessarily increase um, in, increase the um, the value of awards. And, and you might say, well, what about your second point? Well, you can. Although before the introduction of this act, it was the case that some experts would say and would form a view that the property is unfit for human habitation. So some experts would say it's prejudicial to health, referring across the Environmental Health Act, but some experts would actually go further and actually say this is unfit for human habitation. But that wasn't a common uh, feature of, of, in, my, in experts' reports, certainly in my experience. If you can walk into court now and say, look, it's unfit for human habitation, are you going to be able to get a higher award because, because of that quality is being emphasized? And now, uh, in my view, um, it, it's, it's really difficult to know. And I think it's probably going to be a case by case basis as to whether it really, really has any effect at all. As a general rule, the reality is that judges look at cases in the round. And if the electrical system isn't working and hasn't been working, irrespective of whether it's it been called unfit for human habitation, judges for the last 20, 20 years or and longer, much longer, obviously, judges will just think this is appalling. It doesn't matter what you call it. They just think this is appalling. And uh, I think that the bottom line is that judges will probably, probably give the same sorts of awards uh, in most cases. Uh, as they've always given before when they're just looking at Section 11 awards. Uh, uh, although there will be the occasional judge and the occasional situation where um, the fact that the property is un breaches this covenant will be used to possibly punish a landlord even more by elevating the level of damages. But it's very difficult to predict in any situation where that will be. It's, a lot will depend on the facts of the case. A lot will depend on the judge in question. So the bottom line is, the rather inconclusive conclusion is reached is section 9a overall is probably not going at the at present there's no indication that it's having very much impact on changing the picture otherwise of damages assessed and quantum awarded under section 11. So let's turn to one or two other uh, let's turn to one or two other two, uh, features of um, damages. Um, general damages of course uh, are not only for the repairing covenants but there are general damages awardable for um, nuisance claims and uh, defective premises act claims. And I'm going to just touch on the nuisance claim uh, first to start with. Um, the object of the damages in a nuisance claim, which is a tortious claim, is to place the claimant in the position that they would have been in had the nuisance not occurred. And where there's physical damage, that means um, the um, measure of the loss, which are not really thinking of physical damages in the sort of short-term residential um, cases where we mainly deal with. But where there's physical damage, then the measure for this is, the, is the, the costs incurred in remediating the damage, or if not remediable, the loss in value of the land. That's a fairly standard uh, common law approach. Uh, the alternative is, is that when there's no physical damage, uh, and as I put this on the, uh, the sheet, that when there's no physical damage, loss of amenity, um, is uh, the loss of immunity of the land or discomfort and convenience by this can be compensated by a lump sum award. Uh, and this is very interesting because if you, and leaving aside disrepair, if you look across into the law of nuisance at uh, cases where um, people have owned land, if there's a pig farm nearby and as a result they're affected by smell, 
or there is somebody who sets up a speedway stadium next door and they're affected by the noise of the racing. Um, you can get lump sum awards for this, uh, for the damages, the loss of immunity as such. Uh, and, and it's interesting when you look at these awards, they've, they've tended to be relatively low and they've tended to be in multiples of maybe 500 pounds, 1,000 pounds, 2,000 pounds, 3,000 pounds, something of that, that sort. <coughs> um, it's not, it's not a subject on which there's, a, there's an awful lot of um, very detailed authority. Um, and, and it's interesting uh, the way that this subject, uh, and I'll come around to this in a minute, it's interesting the way that the subject sort of reflects the law of damages and disrepair, perhaps not surprisingly. So for some, some examples, and this is, the, I think, the primary example of nuisance that, that, that practitioners have to deal with is, is the nuisance of infestation. Um, at the bottom end, as Rob has referred to, um, I've taken an example from legal action group examples. At the bottom end, there may be a ward, uh, there's an example of an award there for £300 per annum for fairly minimal, almost de minimis infestation with mice. And at the top end of the spectrum, um, you've got an award there, excuse me, <coughs> You have an award there for £3,500 per annum for a heavy infestation of cockroaches. And um, to pick up that point about the analogy with general damages under Section 11, um, instead of having a lump sum, um, it is possible also to find uh, the judges uh, awarding uh, damages by reference to loss of rent. And that makes, that makes an awful lot of sense. Why, when someone suffers loss of immunity, why, just because it's a nuisance case, why shouldn't that also be referable to the loss of the value of the land, the income value of the land, or the use value of the land, which is, of course, the rental value of the land? So I put in a, an example case down there, Harwood and Reunion, uh, where a judge awarded 20% of the rent uh, in relation to uh, damages in relation to a rat infestation. Um, and of course, there's an overlap here, something I probably should have said right at the start is, of course, this area of damages involves lots of overlaps. Well, as you'll be aware, the causes of action overlap quite substantially. And there, and there are also overlaps in the way that you can calculate or bring elements of loss within the heads, different heads of damages. Um, so, for example, in a case where um, you have uh, infestation by mice, uh, and the mice are getting in through holes, let's say, in the pipework in the kitchen. Um, it's possible to argue that the holes uh, in the kitchen in the, behind the cupboards are disrepair because the landlords put in pipes and they weren't in that condition to start with. Uh, and it's that you it's possible to get an expert to say that it's it's fallen below a proper stand, uh, proper uh, standard of repair. And therefore, it's possible to argue that because of the disrepair, the existence of the holes, the mice are getting in, and therefore this is just a consequence of disrepair. That's one way of arguing it, in which case you can argue it according to the principles that Rob's discussed. Alternatively, you could argue it as nuisance on the basis that the mice are getting in from the landlord's land, the common parts outside the flat, and coming in, and therefore it's, it's nuisance. In fact, the truth is it's a, it, you can run the claim both ways. It, it, there may be circumstances where you can't run it as a Section 11 claim, but you, usually or often you can run it in, in the same way. So that would be a situation where you may be able to use whichever you try to use, the measure of damages which you found uh, gave you the most money in the case that you was arguing for the tenant and the converse where you're arguing on behalf of the landlord. Um, I think a, a last point to mention here, and this is a point that Rob's mentioned as well, is that of course, damages, common law damages, when you're using the lump sum approach for nuisance, would also be subject to a, an uplift, the Simmons and Simmons 10% uplift. And I think that there is a, a bit of an issue here. Uh, I, 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 I've never seen, I haven't seen any authority of this, and I haven't seen this discussed anywhere, but I think there is an issue here about uh, Simmons and Simmons. And, and it, it focuses in on what we've been discussing about, this comparison of lump sum awards an assessment, objective assessment of some of the sort of inconvenience that somebody suffered, as opposed to a deduction from rental value, which is a very accurate assessment of the use value and then using a percentage to bring it down. There's an interesting, an interesting point here for Simmons and Simmons. A lot of the awards, lump sum awards, particularly in personal injury, and I think that's why Simmons and Simmons was introduced, uh, a lot of the lump sum awards are seen as being are seen as being outdated. In other words, there was an outdated approach to compensation. 
and that the historical culture of awards of compensation has been slightly slightly lower than it should be and that's why 10 percent has been added to these lump sum awards but is that an is that an appropriate approach when you're using this alternative measure where you've got an accurate market value for the use or the amenity of the property, what the, what the immunity, the full immunity is worth. How is that appropriate to say in the last year where the accurate values, the, te- the, the property is worth 5,000 pounds a year uh, and you say you've lost half the value, 50%, why on earth should you get another 10% on top of that? And I ask that rhetorically because I think there is there is an issue there, and of course, in most cases, it probably doesn't make too much. Um, it does probably it doesn't make too much difference, but it, it, it is an issue, and one day that's probably going to be looked at. Um, I think that when you're when you're dealing with the ten percent, obviously it depends which side of the fence you're on. If you're a tenant, you want it. If you're for acting for a landlord and you're trying to avoid the impact of this ten percent, particularly in leaseholder cases or in a case where you're looking at nuisance damages like this, you, you may well be you may well be wanting to uh, almost reverse engineer the situation and, and pushing for a figure or it's settling whether you're settling or indeed arguing you, you you should be thinking about the figure when you're basing your arguments. You should be thinking about the figure with the ten percent already built in, in order to try and avoid over overcomp- what might be argued to be overcompensation in certain situations. Right, now we've got to uh, 52. I'm only going to go for three minutes more. I'm going to go quickly through the final points, which aren't, I don't think, going to take too, too much trouble. Um, the uh, damage to the Defective Premises Act, that's very much a tortious measure. You're, you're either valuing damages to the person or to property. It's a fairly standard approach. And I'll, I'll repeat, come back to, on that on one point. Um, and the valuation is going to be very similar to the valuation of special damages. Um, in the context of personal injury, um, which could be seen as special damages, or they may be seen as general damages in the context of a disrepair claim. Um, you simply you could go to Kemp and Kemp if you've got any particular personal injury or health complaint or aggravation of asthma and the like. You can get you can go to there to, to find out what the award is likely to be. Um, mental distress and anxiety. I've put that down there. That theoretically could be a part of men, uh, special damages. Um, in, in fact, uh, I think that it's now, as Rob has indicated and we discussed, it's, it's now mental distress has really been absorbed within the approach to general damages for disrepair. And even though generally in law contract, you can't get damages for distress, and it seems to be against the general principle, today it does seem to be accepted that mental distress is part of uh, the measure of general damages. Um, aggravated damages and exemplary damages. Um, can we get those um, in? Uh, can we get those in a disrepair claim? Very seldomly, and you'd have to link those to a tortious claim. So it might be appropriate where there's a nuisance. It might be appropriate by analogy if somebody's deliberately not doing disrepair, a nuisance or has arisen, or a defective, possibly a defective premises act claim arises. And the landlord's deliberately trying to get the tenant out. So by analogy with un- unlawful eviction. Um, and that brings me to damage to personal property, which I think is the other interesting point in this, in this part of the talk, which is that how do you how do you value that? The key point here is whether when somebody's had their goods damaged, um, should they be compensated for the full value of a new item of property or, or not? Should there be a deduction for betterment? And the answer is, is that uh, as the answer is, and I'll just flick on to, uh, where are we? No, the answer to that question is that um, there should be no deductions unless it is possible or reasonable to get secondhand replacements. Um, And that seems to be a very sensible, uh, a very sensible approach. Um, In the case of Clark versus Affinity in Sutton Homes, that's 2014, The judge refused to make any deduction in relation to carpets that were destroyed in a flood on the basis that it would be very difficult to get purchase secondhand wall to wall carpeting. So in in, in practical terms, um, in practical terms, how do you deal with special damages? And it's 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 not easy. Um, It's not easy. Um, The I know one colleague of mine who brings a catalogue 
a, a catalogue of items along to court and cross, cross examines um, tenants who's due for the case hasn't settled and asks, is, is your item a bit like this? And uses the cheapest possible catalogue, maybe a, um, a, one of the um, one of the stores that provides a, a, one of these catalogues with a full range of items, furniture, including goods and bedding and clothing, etc. And just provides that, and the person can identify what the um, what the item is has been damaged. And this is, in a sense, almost saying, "Well, we'll give you the new uh, the cost of the item. It will be a cheap version." And that, in a sense, just justified by saying, "Well, you you're not going to get the full value, but you'll get something um, new." Um, I wanted to make a point about um, special damages. I'm going to pass over um, the principles of if there's damage to the. the situations where there's damage to the demise premises uh, that's not a common situation in short-term resident residential tenancies likewise the cost of repair work that's not a common situation there's more leaseholder issues and i'm not today going to go into the issue of where the disrepair is so severe that the, the tenant moves out and there are costs of alternative accommodation and removals and storage those are all special damages and the cost of those are all recoverable but the point I did want to finish on special damages is the pre-action protocol for housing condition cases, paragraph 5.2G. That requires a landlord, and this is very much more, uh, uh, that, uh, th so this is a landlord's point, that requires a tenant in the letter before claim to set out, and there is an annex form provided, what their special da damages claim is. Now, I think there'll be a lot of practitioners who have experience in this area, where if it's a tenant practitioners, they forget the claim formulated, but it, the tenant or the client has not provided all the detail of what property has been lost as special damages. And equally, landlords tend to get letters without any full details of special damages. Uh, one often sees claims being issued and particulars of claims which say details of special damages will be forwarded at a later stage. This it seems to me is quite, is quite wrong. It, the, it's very important that anything that's been damaged is identified at the earliest possible stage. And um, what you have, this, you have this problem that if this is not dealt with carefully at the start of the claim, you've got the risk that something quite inflated, certainly from a landlord's perspective, a risk that something quite inflated can be provided, uh, you know, halfway through or towards the point in time of settlement. And that's really not, not right. You need to know where you stand in terms of settlement. And I think that's true for both sides here um, at the start of the case. Um, I'm not going to say very much, finally, about tenants failing to mitigate. We've all had cases where the main defence, as, as far as a landlord is concerned, concerned, is the failure to give access. That is a proper defence. Uh, likewise, if the tenant is not given access, uh, um, there's a question of proving that, and that's extremely difficult. Um, on that said, an impecunious tenant, and this is not an issue about access, but an impecunious tenant will not be required to take unaffordable steps. That would not be part of the defence. Right, I'm going to stop there. Um, I'll just say finally that um, tenant's failure to mitigate is a, is a perfectly good uh, defence, and it all should always be considered. Likewise, tenant's contributory negligence, although that is essentially a defence to a tortious claim in disrepair, to primarily nuisance or defective premises act. And, and Rob has touched on interest, obviously interest for general damages, pro quite proper to claim interest on general damage from the midpoint of any year of claim, and on special damages from the date of damage. So I'm sorry to have rushed that at the end of it. We have squeezed absolutely everything in. And the question now is, um, do we have um, any questions? Rob, can you see um, any questions that have come up on our... There, there are a few, Desmond. Um, if have you, you had a chance to have a think about one? If you have a go... Ben. Yes, yes, I, I, I've had a look at a few. Uh, there was a question um, during my talk that, that asked, what is, is the 2% interest for and, and whether the Simmons and Castle uplift is in lieu of interest or in addition to it? Um, and the simple answer is that they're both applicable. You add the 10% the uplift to your the figure that you've arrived at. And with that uplifted figure is when you then apply interest from the midpoint of the loss for, for general damages. Um, I, th there's one or two more that I, I could answer if you want to consider the ones that I don't answer, uh, Desmond, and then we'll you, like you, if you can have a you've had a look, if you've had a look at one or two, you, you carry on. That was Kim's question. Um, yeah, there was another one that asked whether it, whether it was compulsory to, to apply the 10% uplift. Um, uh, 
the current position, although I, I think the point that you've raised, Desmond, is very interesting on about, you know, whether this principle should apply to to disrepair when uh, we know what the rental value is. Um, but but currently the, the position is, yes, uh, if, if the matter is litigated and it, and it gets to court, then in principle, um, a, a tenant recovering damages is entitled to a 10 percent uplift on those damages. Um, but I, I thought it was funny that the, the perspective um, was from a, a local authority uh, employee who who's uh, rather candidly admitted that their approach is to offer as, as little as possible, yet remaining reasonable. Um, so I think if you're if you're looking at it from from the perspective of a settlement, you, you're not bound to apply Simmons and Castle. So, so you might chance your arm at, at making an offer without adding the ten percent. Um, really, it depends on the savviness of the uh, the tenant or their legal advisor to to spot whether it's been applied or not. Um, uh, but that, that that's my answer to that. Yeah, uh, uh, there's some special damages questions at the end. Um, Sim asks a question, how do you value special damages, general special, when the repairs have still not been carried out and damages are accruing? The answer is, at some point in time, somebody has to commit to doing the repairs by a given date. You've got to get some sort of, you've got to cap off the claim. So what you do is you say, well, let's assume that the claim will be done by in, in three months time. What would the damages claim and the special damages be if that was the case? And then you try to enter into a settlement um, using that three month deadline for your client to get the work done or, or for the tenant side um, on, in the hope that the landlord will get the work done by then. That then date tends to go into a Tomlin order. And then, of course, if it all falls apart and the work is not done, the tenant is then looking at enforcing that Tomlin order and moving on and getting extra damages as well as seeking an injunctive relief against the landlord. So, and Jenna, I'll take your special damages question uh, because it goes alongside. If the special damages schedule is not completed, can the landlord assume that there are no special damages? Well, that's a nice question. I think probably if you're in front of his honor judge, Jan Luber, the answer would be yes. He would say that the, land, uh, the, 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 the tenant must provide the, um, must provide the special damages. You can't just get, walk into a claim and just say, oh, I've got this up my sleeve. So at the very least, it should be there in the particulars of claim. Um, if it's not there in the particulars of claim, yes, you can. And you would get, get on and make your part 36 offer or your without prejudice offer. And then that then that then um, that then holds the tenant to the state of the claim at uh, that point in time before any includes um, uh, see, what else have we got? Anything a question, there's a question asked about if if the tenants decanted, uh, do we offer compensation up to the date they move out or until the works are completed? Um, I think my answer to that is that the principle for awarding damages is for the breach of covenant. So in principle, compensation should run until the works are completed. But if the tenant is decanted, I think there's a good argument to say that the loss of amenity has been mitigated. And so therefore, the award should be should be reduced as a result. Yeah, the only, the only I agree. And the only thing I'd say is that although you've got your completion end date, don't forget your your client is entitled to. Uh, take a, a certain period of time to do the work. So once the once notice has been given, um, what the, the client has a reasonable amount of time to do the work. And this is a very difficult repair job that's needed in two or three months' time. No damages for those two or three months, even if the tenant has to move out. Uh, for two or three months, th that's that's the period of time you're allowed to get the work done. But after that, then the period of the, the damages run. Um, but yes, as Rob says, no. It, once uh, once it's been heavily mitigated, any 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 loss to the tenant, then you would hopefully that would stop the, the claim running significantly. Right. What happens if the landlord? This is a non anonymous attendee. Okay. What happens if the landlord attempts to repair the property but not very well, and pays four thousand compensation after three years? Is the tenant is bringing to claim? How likely is it likely to be assessed in the in the light of the attempts the landlord made to repair and the compensation? even though the property is still in disrepair. Well, it's likely that if you've entered into an agreement, it depends how the agreement is phrased, it's likely that if you've entered into a settled agree settlement agreement and money's been paid, that, that that in a sense, uh, that draws a line in the sand in terms of the cause of action that the tenant may have. It does depend on the wording. Uh, but if you have it properly worded, that would draw a line in the sand. And then if there's disrepair still continuing, after that particular agreement is made, 
then a further claim will arise, I would have thought. What do you think, Rob? Yes, that, that was going to be my answer. The, the, the damages can continue to flow until the property is in repair. So whilst that might draw a line in the sand to the, the point that the settlement is uh, accepted, if, if the repairs aren't done, then, then there's a fresh claim there. Yes, I think um, we've covered Kim's question and Lisa's question. Uh, what's this next question from is the same or another anonymous attendee? Are you aware of the cases where damages are awarded solely for structural movement, internal cracking? <coughs> yes. I'm dealing with a case where the property's been affected by movement. We've mostly seen minor internal cracking in half the rooms. No other issues. It's been going on for many years. A lot relates to the clay subsoil on which the property was built and also influence of neighbouring trees on neighbouring land. That's not owned by the council. It's good to see how damage is in any. Well, the answer is yes, because um, the, the property itself is out of repair. Um, assuming that this is within the concept of repair and that you're, it's not, you're get, not fundamentally going to do the repair and give back something different, there is physical... What, what, what is disrepair? The answer to the question is, with the exception of gutters, gutters which are blocked are in disrepair. With the exception of gutters, it's a question of physical damage. Is there physical damage from a better condition? That's the first question. And here, if there's internal cracking, there is disrepair. The damages will reflect the inconvenience, discomfort and distress. So the question is, well, what did the tenant suffer by this? It's not very nice living with cracking. The tenant might be worried, but if the tenant has been reassured that the cracking is perfectly safe and that there's no danger of collapse or anything like that, well then, Perhaps the, the, the damage, is, the damage is not going to be as high as something which seriously impacts on their everyday use of the property. Um, I, certainly, I've done cases where subsidence and cracking, or there was associated water entry and the like, but I've done cases where it, significant damages were awarded for, for cracking. But if it's very minor and cosmetic, well, obviously, the damages are going to be fairly low. Would you, do you want to say anything more on that one, um, Rob? No, no, I, I was going to move on to, a, to another one. Um, yeah. Another one from an, an anonymous attendee has asked, if the tenant has failed to give access as a result of hospital appointments, would the landlord still be able to rely on a failure to give access as a defence? And I think the, the answer to that is it really depends on, on the evidence, really. If, um, if there's good evidence that, that the tenant really did have to go to, to hospital and make those appointments on the dates that um, were agreed for access, then... Um, that's that's probably fine. But if if the landlord's um, really gone above and beyond to offer lots of different dates um, to the extent that you it, it's unlikely that the uh, the tenant had a hospital hospital appointment on every one of those days, then I think you would have a good defence because the court would start to think, well, you know, that, that the uh, the appointments aren't genuine. If, if so many offers for access have been made um, and, and you're still not getting in, then eventually um, the, the tenant starts to lack credibility. Yeah, I think there's an interesting there's a, an interesting sort of similar point there, an interesting similar problem there. If if let's say the tenant is unable to give access because the tenant is actually um, seriously unwell, maybe on on in hospital or even at home and unwell and recuperating for a significant period of time, and it's really inappropriate to have works being done while the tenant is recuperating or in hospital. What would be the position there? Well. That's who who bears the burden of that? That 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 period of time when the tenant can't give access is it the landlord that bears the burden of, of the fact that this is just a, something that's happened and it's unfortunate that the tenant's not being unreasonable, or is it the is it the tenant that bears the burden on the basis that the landlord wants to get in and do it? It's only because the tenant won't give access that the the, the landlord can't get in. And I, I confess I've asked the question. I'm not absolutely certain, and I wouldn't want to. What well, do you think, think, Rob, on that one? Well, I think that feeds into uh, Paul Leck Perigin's question, which asks, how do you measure a reasonable time from notice to completion to avoid liability for damages? And using that example, I think that would be a good argument on behalf of the landlord to say, well, you know, we 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 know that the repair needs to be done, but we can't get in. So it's not unreasonable for us not to have completed the works by this, this point because um, the tenant's in hospital, so there's nothing we can do. I think you could certainly make that argument. Yes, yes. I mean, when the tenant's in hospital and the tenant doesn't need to be in the property, certainly arrangements could be made by the tenant to let somebody else uh, let the landlord in. That's one point. But if the tenant's actually in the property and recuperating, that's quite a tricky one. But yeah, I think that's arguable either way. Um, can the claimant bring a PI claim under the Defective Premises Act and rely on a diagnosis of shadowing the lumps due to it? Yes, 
I, I'd be, I, to, to be honest, the, 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 I personally do not have, have not an awful lot of experience. I'm not a personal injury lawyer. I don't have an awful lot of experience of PI claims attached to defective, uh, to, to disrepair claims. But yes, the answer to that is clearly yes. In fact, that sounds to me like a, a, a personal injury claim where the cause of action is really the Defective Premises Act. Defective Premises Act is a duty of care owed to prevent any loss of injury to the person or to the person's belongings. So it's just like a duty of care in tort. Mm. I think we'll uh, we'll finish on, on one more question that's just come in from an anonymous, anonymous attendee, which is asked if the tenant isn't aware of an appointment and the landlord just turns up, is that a failure to allow access? Um, the answer to that is no. Um, the landlord under the lease will almost certainly have to provide notice of um, of coming around. And so if they, if they don't do that, then uh, it, it, the, the landlord can't say that there was a failure to... Uh, to get access. Oh, I'll take, I go on, I'm going to take one more. How do you measure a reasonable time? You can have another one as well. But how do you measure a reasonable time from notice to completion to avoid liability for damages? Well, there are a lot of, certainly local authorities who have handbooks and they've, they've, they've gone away with their surveyors and they've worked out the time periods for different types of repair. And you will find in some tenants' handbooks that there are actually set periods of time. And, and you'll find also that in, in, in the responsive systems, responsive repair systems, certain disrepair will be categorized as urgent and then a, a medium urgency and then not so urgent. It's a rule of thumb. You need to go to your surveyor and in any, it's a case by case thing. You need to go to your surveyor and you need to ask your surveyor how much, what is a reasonable time to get this done? And it's the surveyor who will be able to answer that question at the end of the day. All right. And another one that's come in is asked if the tenants refuse five decant offers over a period of five years, do you have to pay compensation for that period? Uh, again, I think this is a mitigation argument. In, in principle, yes, you do, because that's that's their tenancy. They're entitled to live in a, in a property that's in repair. But if if you've offered them suitable alternative accommodation, they've turned it down. It's going to be very difficult for them to, to say I've suffered a, a loss of amenity because it, because it could have been mitigated by by moving. It's an interesting one that because the decant offer is is that a, that's not a decant for temporary accommodation that's a decant for permanent a permanent decant. Well, let's if you if you if you treat this as a temporary, I don't think it's temporary an offer of temporary accommodation for five years, is it? That seems unlikely to me. That it's just temporary accommodation and then you go back off. It sounds to me like that you're trying to offer the tenant a, a, a permanent uh, a alternative accommodation. I don't think the tenant is obliged to take permanent accommodation. I don't, I, I, can't, I, I don't think that, I think a tenant is entitled to the repair of the property that the tenant has under the contract. So you can try and make the tenant move, and if the tenant moves, fine, but if the tenant won't go, I'm afraid you're rather stuck with that. On the other hand, if you've been trying to get, if the works require the tenant to move out, and for five years you've been asking them to move into temporary accommodation, and they've been refusing for five years, absolutely, that's failure to mitigate loss. Anything else you want to add? Uh, no, I think uh, I think we'll leave it there. Okay, we'll say we'll say uh, good night and um, thank you for attending. And um, we hope to see you, or in in our alternative colleagues, we'll hope to see you at the next um, uh, disrepair um, Zoom session, which will be in a few weeks' time. And cheerio. Thank you very much.